it's hard to believe, but it's been 10 years since uh, Hurricane Katrina struck uh, in, uh, on August 28th. And uh, in researching uh, where the Katrina fell in, uh, in the pecking order of, of natural disasters that have hit this country, uh, I, I started researching the hurricane of 1900 that hit Galveston and more than hit Galveston, all but wiped it off the map. And it was a fascinating story to me. And I, as I got into it a little bit more and a little bit more, I thought, I mean, I don't think a lot of people know of how bad this is. I mean, folks in the Gulf region uh, have a pretty good idea, but the average person in America, I don't think knows. And the more I researched it, the, the more deeply into it I, I got. So I decided, you know, maybe I could make a book out of this. But I, I have limited skills, uh, as you, you probably see every morning. So um, I, I hired a guy, his name's Bill Hoagland, who's a wonderful author in his own right, but is a marvelous researcher. And as he delved into this and he would shuttle me information, I. The more I saw, the more I, I became fascinated by this, and the more I, I decided this was a terrific story because Galveston represented a lot of this country at the turn of the century. A can-do attitude, uh, a, a belief that we were masters of our domain, that we could take anything and make it better. Uh, Galveston, a uh, hundred years earlier, less than a hundred years earlier, uh, was. Uh, a, a sandbar that was the headquarters for Jean Lafitte the pirate uh, and a few decades later it was a uh, center for shipping for cotton for uh, industry uh, it's a, it was a town a city of 37,000 yet it had per capita more millionaires than any place in America first electric lights were strung in Galveston, the street lights were strung in, in Texas, were strung in Galveston. Uh, it had an opera house, had an ornate city hall. Uh, it was, by many's, uh, many people's uh, approximation, it was the Paris of the South. And uh, the preeminent, the largest, the largest U.S. Weather Bureau outside of Washington, D.C., was located in Galveston. Uh, it was bigger than New Orleans. It was really, in a sense, the epicenter of shipping along the Gulf Coast. And so, uh, and they had had hurricanes before. They had had storms, but they've always we they had always weathered them. They had always uh, dealt with them. There was a belief that a major hurricane could not hit Galveston, could not hit along the Gulf Coast that these storms had a natural curve and that uh, Texas was not part of that curve. So adding to that, uh, there was a belief at the U.S. Weather Bureau that they were the supreme forecasting entity in North America and if not the world. Yet, in fact, uh, the Cuban government, and not even the go Cuban government, but the Jesuits in Cuba had actually the foremost forecasting center for Caribbean hurricanes. However, the U.S. Weather Bureau, the head of the U.S. Weather Bureau, did not believe in consulting with the Cubans, did not want people thinking the Cubans were superior to them, so basically shut down the Cuban forecasts that were coming out of Cuba because the U.S. controlled the telegraph lines. So uh, on the fateful morning of September 8th, when Cuba knew that there was a major hurricane moving through uh, the Caribbean, uh, they knew their forecast was for this to intensify once it passed through the Caribbean islands, got out into the Atlantic Gulf Coast, would strengthen and would take aim at the Texas coast, probably somewhere within 100 miles of Galveston. However, that forecast was never disseminated because it was cut off from being disseminated by the U.S. Weather Bureau. 